Well, there's a lot going on in the National Football League, so let's talk to our good friend Brad Spielberger on Twitter, at PFF underscore Brad. Writes and contributes for PFF.com and does salary cap free agency stuff. He's got a free agent list up at PFF.com right now, ranking the top free agents uh, that'll be in this year's class. He joins us now. Brad, good morning. Thanks for hopping on with us. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Hey, not that it was a surprise to you, because I think everybody was expecting it. Uh, Russell Wilson finally got cut. We had a Denver guy on about a week or two ago uh, who said this was going to be when they were going to cut him, and this was how they were going to divide up the, what, $85 million in cap dead cap money. Can you walk us through what the dead cap money means, how they get through it, and just what you thought of them cutting bait with Russell Wilson kind of so quickly after getting that contract? Yeah, yeah, this is funny. I wrote an article about the whole situation in October. Uh, so the, yeah, the writing has been on the wall <laughs> for this move coming. But, yeah, so at, at a very high level, $85 million in total dead cap, which is the NFL record by more than double. Uh, Matt Ryan had the record at about $40 million when he was traded to the Indianapolis Colts. They are going to split it over two years, though. So this season, they'll take a $35 million dead cap hit. It's actually neutral in terms of they're not losing any cap space this year. Um, and then next year, though, they'll have a 45, or sorry, 49, almost $50 million dead cap hit um, for Russ not being on the roster you know, a year later. So <clears throat> obviously it's a, it's a massive financial penalty, uh, but we have seen that you know, the jump in the salary cap this year, which is going to continue, and, and Denver just does not want to allow guarantees in 2025 to kick in. So – Russ is owed $39 million this year, which he's going to earn, you know, minus any offsets from a different contract with another team. Uh, but then what Denver is avoiding is another $37 million becoming fully guaranteed for 2025 if he was on the roster. So, yeah, he's going to end up making about $124 million for, you know, a, a couple seasons of subpar play uh, and, and sub-500 records. It's, it's probably the worst trade and sign in the history of the NFL, uh, certainly in the conversation, um, and, and we'll see where he goes. All of that said, I find it kind of fascinating that he could, in theory, sign a near-minimum contract elsewhere because I mentioned those offsets. No one's going to pay him more than $39 million this year. So maybe some team says, look, Russ, we'll pay you 5 mil. You'll make 34 from Denver and we'll surround you with talent, see what we can do. Um, that makes it intriguing, but, but I wouldn't be shocked if the days of Russell Wilson being a, a clear starter might be over. Do you have a team that makes a lot of sense for him? It, it, it's tough. So, you know, I, I think there are the obvious ones, like a Pittsburgh who's mentioned bringing in competition. I don't know if it's a great fit with Arthur Smith, who wants to attack the middle of the field, get the ball out fairly quickly, two things that Russell Wilson does not really do. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I do, like I said, that the contract dynamic to me is the biggest piece. If he's willing to take that really, really small deal, it then opens the door to more potential opportunities. I know people have mentioned the New England Patriots, uh, just hired Alex Van Pelt, an offensive coordinator, who's worked with a ton of different quarterbacks. Maybe they're not sold on this quarterback class. They want to bring in a veteran, mm -hmm. kind of help him galvanize and, and get this team back on track and then they'll bring in a rookie going forward. But, yeah, it, it, it's tough. Like, I don't think any of the teams that are really trying to find a starter, you know, your, your top three picks, I guess minus New England, your Atlanta, your Minnesota, like, I don't know if any of those teams make a whole lot of sense. Brad, I want to jump over to uh, today being the last day for franchise tags. Teams can franchise tag uh, a possible free agent. Is there any chance that there's any last-minute contract extensions done, or are you seeing, uh, you know, guys like Brian Burns? They're probably going to get thrown on the franchise tag uh, by their teams. I think the only one today that that wouldn't shock me if it gets done uh, is Justin Medebike in Baltimore. Um, I, I do think none of the, you know, the, the six names that I think will get tagged today, uh, you know, Jalen Johnson, Chicago, that'll be a tag. I don't expect an extension to get done there. Um, maybe uh, the, the team has a strong offer out there. Maybe we see a deal get done, but I, I don't expect it. Um, Michael Pittman and in Indy, I don't think we're going to get a deal done. Anyway, long answer short, I don't want to go through all the names, but the only one that I think could get done um, is Justin Matabike in Baltimore, and even that one, I'm not super confident we see that deal get done. 
Brad Spielberger, our guest here, Pro Football Focus on Twitter, at PFF underscore Brad. Also the author, co-author of The Drafting Stage. You can go find that out there. He does a lot of great work for PFF. Dot com. Uh, look, the combine isn't just for the rookies anymore. I mean, the measurements, the workouts, those are great. Those are entertainment, but it's become just the you know the big event. Everybody meets up before the draft, and there's a lot of talk. Uh, any chatter you were interested in hearing, maybe from somebody at PFF or just in general talking to folks about how the league feels about things right now. I said earlier, I hope a team gives Legarius Sneed a big contract that the Chiefs have to trade him for because. That seems to be the only way you can maybe stop the Mahomes train is try to beat up the defense and take guys away. It feels unstoppable. What was the takeaway for you at the Combine uh, this year and just what people were saying? Yeah, the, the Sneed tag was a bit of a surprise. <clears throat> uh, I do think it's an example. You know, the salary cap jump I don't think is as meaningful as maybe you know fans think, but I think it's like one transaction per team. And maybe for Kansas City, it's, hey, why would we let LeJarius Sneed just hit the open market as probably the clear corner available because Jalen Johnson's not going to be, um, and get a third-round comp pick hypothetically. Let's tag him. Someone maybe gives us a second-round pick and then pays him, which I still think is what they're trying to do. I don't know if they want to extend him. Maybe he just plays on a tag for about $20 million and goes from there. Um, but that one was surprising. And like you said, I, I mean, if, if the Chiefs defense is this good, it's going to be hard to beat Patrick Mahomes, especially because they're going to get better on offense. Other combine chatter, you know, more draft-related, I think you're going to see J.J. McCarthy go very, very early. I don't know the first person to say this, but I think he'll be a top-seven pick in the NFL draft maybe earlier. Brad, Brad, um, Brad can I interrupt you real quick on that? Um, yeah, I, don't know yeah. how, I don't know how much college you're able to watch, given what you do, but have you seen McCarthy play? And just what, you, what your thoughts are, because a lot of us listeners, we talked about him yesterday, I think a lot of us are just stunned. It's not that he can't be good. It's just like top ten? J.J. McCarthy, top. I watched this guy struggle to throw like eight yard out routes in college with like an amazing team, and so I just I'm I, I'm kind of floored that he's just jumping as high as he is. Yeah, so I watch you know every Saturday I watch the games, less film. Although I, I will tip it to that once you know the free agency slows down a little bit, and I'll actually watch the tape. But I have watched the quarterback because I'm a uh, unfortunately a Bears fan, so I was very in the know on those guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, look, I agree with you on J.J. We saw it at the combine. He was missing some of those those outs and corner routes, you know, during even his throwing session. And I think a big part of that for me is, look, he has a big arm. He is a good athlete. You see so few touch throws on tape when you watch Michigan. Um, like, just not everything is a fastball, but not a lot of layering, not a lot of off-speed stuff. And I think that is my biggest concern with J.J. McCarthy. Um, yeah, look, I, you know, I wouldn't get a top-10 pick on him, but he is young. He is you know, all the intangibles, all the stuff will always hear, all the buzzwords and cliches. Uh, he checks all of those boxes. So, yeah, it wouldn't be what I would do, uh, but but I expect it at this point. Brad, who are some uh, names that we're not hearing in, in the Portland media that were rising in the combine, uh, kind of that, that blue chip prospect or that, that unseen player that after their workout took a big jump up that are now rising up draft boards? Yeah, I think probably some of the winners of the weekend, I think Braden Fisk at Florida State, the D-tackle, uh, maybe kind of a flex 3-4 defensive end slash D-tackle, uh, had a phenomenal combine, and I think, I won't say it was a surprise, but when you watch his film, which I did after, I'll be honest, not, not before, um, like he, it's a ton of like high effort, high energy, play through the whistle, pursuit plays on backside, uh, you know, and he's in the backside of a run, it doesn't look like he's a, he's a great, crazy athlete. And, and then he, you know, it looks like he's a good athlete, of course. He's playing, you know, dominant football at Florida State, but he tossed off the charts. And, and I think he's now, you know, climbing up into probably the top 50 of the draft. Uh, and, and it's well deserved when you pair the two. So I think he was probably the biggest winner. The other guys that I think were winners, we kind of already knew about, but maybe, you know, Quinion Mitchell at Toledo, the corner, is not a household name. Uh, he certainly will be soon. Might even be the first cornerback drafted at this point. Um, after a you know great t- two seasons in, in college and then a phenomenal senior bowl, a phenomenal combine. Last one I'll throw in there. Um, also kind of a household name already, but everyone knows what Malik Neighbors at LSU. The other guy, Brian Thomas Jr., running a four three three forty at six four. Um, I, he was already a first round pick. Now I'm wondering how high does he go? Does he go in the top half of the first round? It is now what I'm wondering. Are you nervous about Caleb? How do you feel as a bet? You mentioned Bears. Are you are you nervous about Caleb? The only thing I'd be nervous about is 
I don't know how long the coach is going to be there, and so it would suck to get a, a rookie quarterback, and they're not good, so they fire Eberflus, and here we go. We're starting a new quarterback or a new coach. And like, How do you feel about Caleb and, and the Bears match? Yeah, you know, there obviously are some concerns. No prospect is perfect and no situation is perfect, but I, I, I think he's a special, special talent. I think he's the clear number one quarterback in the class, so I hope they just stay at one and take him. Um, you know, I think the, the thing that gives me confidence is, Yes, they're drafting first overall, but they're not a first overall pick team, right? Mm-hmm. This is one of the better teams to have number one overall in a while. Um, and then, of course, they have their own, you know, ninth overall pick where maybe you add a, a blue chip receiver, a blue chip tackle, and they might trade down off that pick as well. Um, I- I'm feeling really optimistic. The coaching staff and all that is interesting, but I know Matt Eberflus never lost the locker room, never lost the confidence of, you know, the, the entire building really through some turmoil. So, yeah, look, the Bears, they did the classic, you know, draft the quarterback, then fire the coach uh, with both Justin Fields and Mitch Trubisky, <laughs> so you can't rule it out. Um, but but I think, slash hope, that they get it right this time. Yeah, good stuff. PFF underscore Brad. Brad Spielberger, our good friend from ProFootballFocus.com. He's got a great list of the free agents out right now at PFF.com. We always enjoy the time, Brad. Thanks for hopping on with us this morning, and we'll catch up with you soon. Of course, thank you. All right, there we go. Good stuff. Brad Spielberger, PFF.com. Again, his free agent ranking list is out there at PFF.com. Uh, but some takeaways. Russ Wilson cut. Likes the Steelers as a potential match there. And as a Bears fan, not not so much nervous. Likes Caleb. Thinks the situation can be okay for Caleb. I, yeah, and, and I kind of agree with him. I tend to feel like the Caleb Williams stuff is self-created. To a little bit. It's like, let's find a way to nitpick this guy because he was awesome and he had to come back to college for another year. And we just seem to do this every time a a quarterback has a great season, Heisman Trophy season. You come back, then let's nitpick their game and find the flaws.